Welcome to West Union Baptist Church. I am glad that we're here for services. We're here to worship on this day. We're also out there on video. Uh, I just took me a long time to get it out on uh, YouTube last week, but we will uh, we'll try to do better this week for those who are out there still watching at home. I know there's not a whole lot of people doing that, but still some are watching at home, and so that's that's good. Let's uh, let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we will uh, do some announcements a little bit, sing a song or two, and we'll just get right with it. Bow your heads with me for prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are in your house this day to worship you, for that is our purpose here, to come and worship. And we are at our homes today also to worship you, because we know that you are a God who is everywhere, who has all power, and that we can worship you anytime, anywhere. Father, help us to be your children and to realize that the time to worship you is now, no matter where we are or what we're doing. And that we don't have to wait till we're in trouble to call on your name. We thank you, Father, for the rescues that you've done in our lives. We thank you for the safety that we have had so far. We thank you for the gifts of your love. But most of all, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. As far as announcements, you know on November the 9th that we're going to be taking up the dollar on the pew offering. Uh, that's just where you leave one dollar for every person in your family, or at least that. Let me say that, at least that. And you can give as much as you want to, of course. All of that money goes to Samaritan Ministries, Good Samaritan Ministries in Calhoun, and they use that money to help people who are uh, having trouble paying their power bill or whatever, keep their heat on, that kind of thing in the, in the wintertime. So dollar on the pew comes up on the 9th of November. Uh, also, before we know it, the Lighting Moon Christmas offering will be here. They've already sent us information about the missionaries and, uh, and about uh, you know, the program for this year. So just keep that in mind, too. I know it seems like we Baptist preachers, all we ever do is ask for money in one way or the other. Well, especially Southern Baptists, because we've got missionaries all over the world doing things all the time. But I promise you that all of that work that's being done, especially the Lighty Moon Mission offering, is a blessing because every penny that we give to that goes straight to the missionaries. Not one bit of it is used to uh, help with the office work and all of that that's done at the International Mission Board. All right, that's all I'm going to have for announcements this morning. We're going to sing a couple of songs. I didn't get here in time to give Harley uh, the words to type in the computer for you, so uh, I'm just going to sing a couple of songs I think you'll know. I see hands up, so evidently there are other announcements that must be made. Mike. Good morning, everybody. As we know... This is uh, Pastor Appreciation Time, and we want to thank Jerry and Renee for all they do for the church, for the, the sermons we get, sometimes for the rest we get, and we kind of fall asleep. But <laughs> we have, we have a, a thank you for Jerry and Renee and a little card that was passed around today. They're probably wondering what it was. So. But anyways, we do appreciate you, and we want you to have this. Well, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. That's very generous of you. Louise. We're having a big celebration Saturday. Hurley's family and some of the people that really love Miss Hurley. Saturday, 12 noon, up at the picnic area. Just anybody that wants to come and help Miss Hurley celebrate that 90th birthday. So the Stanley family is having a birthday celebration for Miss Pearlie who will be 90 years old. It's going to be Saturday. It's going to be this Saturday. This her coming? birthday is the 4th of November. Her birthday is actually the 4th of November but they're going to have a little celebration here at the picnic area so it will be outdoors. If any of you want to participate in that you are invited by them to come help celebrate Miss Pearlie's 90th birthday. All right. Well, tell me those times again. I know that's what you were thinking. What time? 12 noon. 
Saturday at 12 noon. Thank you. All right. Y'all ready to sing a little something? Does everyone know there's something about that name? If you don't, I'm going to sing a solo, but I hope that some of you know that. <clears throat> Brother Jeff, will you help us get started? two verses, first and last, of Down at the Cross. sing a solo. And I know you're thankful I didn't have to sing a solo. <laughs> All right, let's get on with the sermon this morning. I'm going to I'm going to uh, pray a quick prayer over the word and then we'll just get started. If you want to, you can already begin looking in John 14 verses 25 through 27. John 14. Pray with me just a moment. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for your Holy Spirit and for the love that you give to us, for the peace that you bring to our hearts. And we ask you, Father, this morning to bless this word, this word of yours, that it may go out from this place into the hearts of your people, that they may hear your voice and not mine, that they may know your presence, if not mine, Father. And I just ask you, on this day, that your Holy Spirit be in control of everything that is done and said, and that your presence here and all around us be known. All these things we ask in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. John 14, verses 25 through 27. We're going to pick up pretty much where we've left off. We've been going through John 14 now for several weeks, and... Uh, I've got a lot out of it. I hope that you have. I, I've really enjoyed this, 
John 14. There's a lot of good stuff in there. As always, I'm going to review a little bit and then we'll, we'll pick up with today's scriptures. But let's start by reading this passage, beginning in verse 25. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled, and do not be afraid. God bless the reading of his word. All right, we have been exploring John 14 now for several weeks. Now to the scholars, John 14 and 15 is known as the farewell cycle. Because, you might say, they are Jesus' farewell instructions before his death on the cross, resurrection from the dead, and ascension into heaven. Jesus knows that he is about to leave his disciples, and he wants to encourage them. He wants to, to give them some strength. He wants to give them something to hold on to after he's gone so that they'll know they're going to be all right. And that they're going to be able to carry his word and build his kingdom in this world. And so he tells us many things. Now his disciples, they still do not want to believe that he's going to die. And we can imagine how that would be. Just think about all of the people around you that you love and you care about. People uh, who have taught you about the word of God. Maybe your parents or grandparents or, or maybe, uh, you know, your friends or Sunday school teacher. There's so many people that if we knew we were going to lose them, we just wouldn't want to believe it, would we? We wouldn't want to believe that they were going to be gone. So naturally, they feel that way. So they're in denial. But he wants them to know that things will be okay even after he is gone. Jesus' words comfort us, all of us as well. He promises us if you remember in the beginning of John 14, that all of us, all of his disciples have a place in heaven. There's a place prepared for each one of us as individuals. There's a place in heaven where we can live with Jesus and God his Father for all eternity. Where we know no matter what happens to us, we have a home in heaven. He promises us that in the beginning of this chapter. And then he tells us the way that we can get there. So that if we have any doubts about how a person gets there, he says to us, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He is the way to heaven. He is telling us the truth about heaven, and he is eternal life. Faith in him is the way that a person gets to heaven. So he's made it clear for us how we can get there. Promised us a place and made it clear how we can get there. He told us that he is in God his Father, and God his Father is in him and that they are one we've discussed this over and over but we know that jesus was as much god as god is he is as much god as god is they are one there's only one god god the father god the son and god the holy spirit are three different ways that the one god presents himself to us so that we can understand him and know him and he can understand and know us his creation in every way Jesus was God the Son. He came here in the flesh. Everything that Jesus teaches us are the words of God his Father and not his own. He says that over and over again. This is not from me. This is from God the Father. I'm telling you what my Father has told me. I am showing you what my Father has shown me. Jesus never claimed while he was here in the flesh that he was more than the one God, God the Father, in heaven we disciples he told us will do even greater works than the works that he did while he was on the face of the earth now we know the great things that jesus did he went around from place to place touching people and healing them he healed people just by saying a word he healed people by telling them something to do if they would go do it they would be healed he went around healing people all over. He also stopped storms just with 
his voice. He also walked on water. He did many, many things. He turned water into wine. Jesus did miracle after miracle, and he says to his disciples and to us, you will do even greater things than the things that I have done. And the reason for that was when he was here on the earth, he was in a human body like us. And so his greatest miracle, which was bringing salvation to many, many people, could only be carried to those that he could get to. Only the people who came under the sound of his voice had the opportunity to know him and to come into salvation, eternal life, and part of God's kingdom. So how is it that we can do even greater miracles than his greatest miracle, which is giving people eternal life? Well, the way that we can do that is through the power of his Holy Spirit. There's so many more of us, millions of us in our world today. And each one of us, with our Holy Spirit inside of us, can go into this world and lead others to salvation. And our world, as we know, is full of people who need Jesus, who need salvation in their lives. And we can be doing the greater miracles no matter what else is going on in the world. There's nothing to keep us from carrying that Holy Spirit that's in us within a social distance of someone and tell them about Jesus. Whatever we ask in Jesus' name, he will do. That's what he promised. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. That's the way he puts it. And the way he is able to do that, of course, is through the power of his Holy Spirit. And in his name doesn't mean just ask anything and put the name Jesus on the end of it and you can have it. What it means by saying in his name is that you are doing something or asking for something that will glorify God, that will glorify Jesus, that will glorify the kingdom. That's what in his name means. It's not just putting his moniker on the end of a prayer. It's asking for something that will build God's kingdom and bring souls to salvation and change this world that we live in. That's what. He means when he says, ask in Jesus' name. He told his disciple that proof of our love to him is obedience to his commands. If you want to prove that you love me, do what I've taught you. Do what I have shown you. Do what you've seen me do. Do what you've heard me say. Learn from me and be me in your world. That is the proof of love for Jesus Christ. That we would be obedient to him. And to be obedient to him in the way he's talking about. Which is not just reading the word and saying the right prayers. And, and knowing all the details of what to do and how to live each day. It's not just doing that. It's being him in this world. How could we do it? The only way we could do it is if the power of God is in us. And how can the power of God be in us? The way the power of God is in us is through the power of His Holy Spirit. Because every Christian, every person who prays in full and complete faith and asks Jesus to come into their heart and be their Lord and Savior receives the fullness of the Holy Spirit at that moment. And from that moment on, the Holy Spirit is the one who is going to change this world. The Holy Spirit is the one that's going to draw people to Jesus Christ. It is He who is going to bring salvation through us. The Holy Spirit working in us. The way we can prove our love is to be obedient to everything that Jesus said and everything that He did and everything that He was and have a heart like His for the world. The world will not accept that Holy Spirit that He gives us. And therefore, they will not have the Holy Spirit within them and they cannot experience the love relationship that we have with God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son. The world is going to reject that Holy Spirit. It's going to reject Jesus as their Savior. And in so doing, they're going to separate themselves from the presence of God and from the power of His Holy Spirit. The world cannot be what we are, which is the family of God. 
And that brings us to today's scripture passage. Look again at verse 25. All this I have spoken while still with you. A short verse, but there's a lot in there, of course. You know, Jesus was still physically with his disciples at the time. He was their paraclete or their advocate. He was the one who took care of everything. He knows that his death is about to come. So his message is urgent. He knows what's coming. He's going to die on the cross for the sins of anyone who will believe in him. He is going to rise from the dead three days later. He's going to reveal himself to his disciples, but not to the whole world at that time. And then he's going to ascend into heaven to be with his Father. He knows all of that is coming. And he knows that his disciples still do not understand and believe everything that is coming. He wants them to be encouraged by his words, by all of the truths that he has told them. He wants them to understand him. Now pay attention. These truths are important. He wants them to know that the Holy Spirit's going to always be with them. He wants them to know that he will never leave nor forsake them. He wants them to know that through that they are going to have power to reach other people for salvation and maybe even healing and all of the other things that Jesus did. He wants them to understand that anything that they ask in His name for the furtherance of His Father's kingdom and to bring glory to His Father, He will do. He wants them to remember and know all of those things. Now look at verse 26. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Now that word in the Greek there is paraclete. Here it is translated in the NIV as advocate. But I'm going to change it to the word counselor because of the context of the rest of this verse. And I'm going to read it to you again using the word counselor. But the counselor, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Here, for the first time in this chapter, John the writer identifies this counselor, this advocate, as the Holy Spirit. This is the first time he uses the words, the Holy Spirit. Earlier in the chapter, he used the word spirit of truth. But he wants us to understand that he is talking about the Holy Spirit of God, the third presence of God in our lives. John only uses this designation of Holy Spirit. He only uses the words Holy Spirit three times in the entire Gospel of John. Only three times he mentions this name Holy Spirit. The reason is he wants us to understand this. The Holy Spirit is here to instruct us and to teach us the truths of Jesus Christ and God his Father and to remind us of what Jesus taught and who Jesus is. He is not a replacement for Jesus. Do you hear what I'm saying? The Holy Spirit's not sent here to take over for Jesus. He is not the new Messiah. He is who Jesus has asked his Father to send to help us. And so, he wants us to remember and be reminded about Jesus. That's the Holy Spirit's purpose. He wants us to remember that Jesus is God's Son. That Jesus is God's plan for humanity's salvation. <coughs> that Jesus in reality, came fully God in the flesh of a human being like us so that he could understand us, so that he could suffer as we suffer, so he could be tempted like we are tempted, so that God could completely understand everything about 
our struggles with sin and all of the things in this world that come up against us, he could completely feel that in the presence of a human body. And yet, because he is God, he could live totally sinlessly without ever failing, without ever making a mistake, without ever doing anything wrong, without ever having an errant thought, without ever sinning in any way. So he overcomes sin by his own righteousness and holiness. Jesus is the sacrifice for our sins. And through him we are given forgiveness and eternal life. The Holy Spirit is here for us to know in our hearts that it is Jesus who made the sacrifice to give us salvation. We're to stay focused on who our Savior really is, Jesus Christ. We're not to begin to believe that the Holy Spirit is more significant than Jesus is. That somehow through the powers that he does in and through us, that he is more significant than Jesus. That's not the Holy Spirit's purpose. His purpose is to teach us, to help us have deeper understanding of the words of God and the words of Jesus and to just know in our hearts that Jesus was who he said he was. The Son of God, the presence of God in human flesh. And the one in whom we can believe and find salvation. The Holy Spirit in us is the evidence of our salvation. But it is Jesus, the Son's work on the cross that saved us. It's not the work the Holy Spirit is doing now that brings us salvation. It is the work that Jesus did on the cross that brings us salvation. Earlier in this chapter, Jesus told his disciples that he would ask his Father to send them the Spirit. But in this verse, he tells them that God is going to answer that prayer. Because he says plainly, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. So Jesus knows that his Father is going to send the Holy Spirit to us to be our paraclete, our advocate, our counselor, our protector. The advocate, that Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he said, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. I don't know about you folks, but for me that's important. I can't remember about half of what I know, and I don't know much. But I still have a hard time remembering these days. It is important to know that that Holy Spirit is going to bring to my heart and my mind what I need to know when I need to know. And if you're a Christian here, you've experienced that. And that you try to witness to somebody and you get tongue-tied and you don't know what to say, the Holy Spirit will remind you what Jesus told you. He'll remind you of the most important thing that he saved you. And knowing that is enough that you can give someone else help to find him. You just have to know what you know. And the Holy Spirit is in us to help us whenever we get in that situation. So don't be afraid of any situation where you have the opportunity to glorify God. Because the Holy Spirit is going to be right there. And he's going to help you get through it. He is to teach us all things. All that we need. And we're going to receive that supernaturally. I don't know about you, but sometimes my mind is too slow and I am too distracted by the things of the world to learn anything like you would normally learn it in school. So thank goodness... The Holy Spirit is going to teach me the things I need to know supernaturally. His Spirit communing with my spirit. His Spirit revealing Jesus Christ in me supernaturally. Because He is the hand of God, the work of God at work in me. He will remind me that Jesus is God's only begotten Son. And that Jesus is the one doing the work in the world. And 1 John 4 verse 2 says this. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit, and he's talking about every human, every human spirit, 
every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. If you want to know how to test the spirits, how to know whether or not the person you're standing next to really knows Jesus, you see if they know and are willing to say that Jesus Christ came in the flesh and died in the flesh on that cross and rose from the dead in the flesh. You see if they believe those things. Because that is, that is the dividing line. That is the dividing line that shows us what being a Christian really is. It is believing those truths without doubt. Believing that Jesus is the Son of God who came in the flesh. That He walked this earth and that He died on the cross for your sins and mine. Lastly, let's look at verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The peace that Jesus gives is different from the ways of the world. Much different from the ways of the world. It calms our troubled hearts and eases our fears even in the face of things like a worldwide pandemic. That spirit of Christ in us, that knowledge of Him, that knowing of His presence, that that word that Jesus spoke to us, promising us peace, gives us a supernatural peace that far goes beyond what humanity can think of and believe. Humanity always wants to see every detail. Humanity always wants for you to show them what tomorrow will bring. But the peace of Jesus gives you peace to your soul and peace to your spirit because you know who he is. You know what he has done. And you know that he is in you. And has made you a promise. That there's a place prepared for you in his heaven. And that someday. Whenever that day he chooses. Comes to pass. You'll be with him. Alive forever. We don't have to be afraid of everything that comes through our world. Our world can be a fearful place. But we have the promise of eternity through the power of Jesus Christ. His apostles lived in a world filled with frustration and anger and violence and sickness and death. Yet with the Holy Spirit, they kept their hope alive and they changed their world for the better. Those first disciples faced a world that hated them and a government that wanted to kill them, seek them out and kill them. They faced all type of diseases and no doctors and no medications like we have in our world today. And yet, through all of the fears that they faced, even often while being martyred, while giving up their lives because they claimed the name of Jesus Christ, even then, they had a peace that surpasses all human understanding. And that peace comes from the power of God alive in us. Christians have always faced troubles in this world. And we still do today. All types of troubles. There certainly is sickness, fear, violence, danger and all of those things in the world today. The world has not changed that much. The world is broken, fallen because of original sin. But the eternal life is promised through faith in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus lives, we have hope and we have peace in our souls. And because Jesus lives, everyone who is out there in our world today no matter what they're facing, can have hope and peace through faith in Jesus Christ. I just want to say I love you and God loves you. 
And I'm going to close this service with a word of prayer. Jeff's going to play a little postlude for us. And then you'll be dismissed. Bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your presence in our hearts and souls so that our spirit communes with your spirit and we know that we belong to you. I thank you most of all for sending your son Jesus Christ in the flesh so that he could show us what God was like if God were in a human being. And he could help us through dying on that cross for our sins, for paying the price for our iniquities, for giving up his life that he might save our lives, that he might forgive us of all of our sins and give us eternal life. And I thank you that, that we have the opportunity to simply believe in that with all of our hearts and our minds and our souls to believe in your son Jesus and that through that we know that we have eternal life. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.